Hello, everyone. Welcome to this live stream. Today, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I have with me the Prudentialist and Semiagog, and we're going to be analyzing this war game as sponsored by NBC uh, between the Americans and the Chinese, which I think will produce some interesting commentary from my guests here. So to get chilling out of the way right at the beginning, uh, you can check out my Substack, charlemagne.substack.com where I've been doing uh, book reviews over the past year. I'm on the 26th one. Those are my paid posts with a free preview, of course, but I very much appreciate the support. Uh, Mr. Prudentialist, anything to show? Uh, absolutely. I also have a new article out on Substack on Kierkegaard, the prudentialist.substack.com. I'll have a video recording out of it as well later this evening. Hopefully by the time we're done with the stream, it'll be uploaded. And then tomorrow, I think you and I are both going to be on Semiagog's stream on the subject of Ukraine. And then I'll be on Oren McIntyre's channel this Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And I cannot, and I cannot stress this enough, please subscribe to Charlemagne's Substack. Uh, this is one of the best things that Charlie's been doing, and it's a great way to financially support our friend out in the wilderness. And yeah, we just had the Digital Archipelago on earlier today covering a lovely article on the woman question. But that's all I've got. Take it away, Oliver. Well, thanks very much for having me on. In terms of my shilling, you can find my books over on Amazon. Uh, there is Vinculum, which is a sci-fi uh, story set in the year 2076. Uh, go and read the blurb over there for details. That's Vinculum with a V and a C. Vinculum. And then there's my uh, collection of poems, uh, Cinders from the Bloomery of Youth. You can find that on Amazon as well cinders from the bloomer review otherwise yes tomorrow um uh, charlemagne uh, the prudentialist and marcus furious pert max god willing uh will be joining me over on my channel we're all just going to do a round table and discuss uh, you know what the hell we see going on in ukraine re reviewing the things that have happened and uh you know giving our our takes and our views on what perhaps uh, will happen in the future Otherwise, follow my channel, follow me on Telegram, follow me on Twitter. Uh, yeah. Uh, and again, thanks for having me, gents. Yeah, so let's jump right into it since it's a 30-minute video. But uh, basically, I stumbled across this thing a while ago. This is actually about a year old, and uh, it's just this war game hosted by NBC. And I thought it'd be insightful to just watch it and comment on it and uh, see what we can come up with. I mean, I guess the gist from what I've seen is uh, these Warhawks are just freaking crazy the way they think. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation and just let me know anytime you want to pause and yeah there we go okay i'm hitting play did you press the little box that says share system audio or tab audio yeah, no, I, 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 can't hear I always I always miss that stupid thing. Fortunately, uh, absolutely nothing of value was said. I thought you said you could hear it. First time when we you can played, hear you. When we tested, we could. No, no, when you. Yeah, that's you hear weird. It before, huh? didn't we hear it before, Prude? Wait, hold on. I think I missed the box. <laughs> Don't miss this, the box. Uh... Yeah, I shared the window. And then I hit play. Oh, no, no audio. Dude, what? We just tested this right before we went live. What the hell? I hate StreamYard so much for this crap. Um, all right, let me try this. Hello there. How about you? Yep, yep. We do an in-depth exploration of okay. a single topic. Today, we have a unique and special episode. This is a war game that takes a look at how the United States might react if China were to invade Taiwan, the self-governed island, a little bigger than the state of Maryland that sits about 100 miles off the coast of mainland China at the junction of the East and South China Seas. China has seen Taiwan as a breakaway province ever since Chiang Kai-shek and his forces fled there following their defeat by the communists in the Chinese Civil War in 1949. China has vowed to take control of this island, preferably, it says, by peaceful means. 
but possibly by force if necessary. Increasingly, U.S. officials warn it could be by force and possibly sooner than we think. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. So what would the U.S. do? Yeah. Well, the United States has ever closer ties with Taiwan, which it sees as a key partner in the Pacific security order. Well, the United States would defend Taiwan if it were attacked. Yeah, I really by China, can't however, stand this guy. Is a I, don't, I don't know what's his called name. Strategic ambiguity, Chuck which Todd. has been the policy for more than 40 cunt, years. Cunt face. The Pentagon, though, is unambiguously preparing for that possibility. And war games, which are simulations of military conflict that help develop and test strategies, well, these war games figure very prominently into those preparations. And we wanted to know more about these war games. What do they look like? How do they unfold? What would it take to win, especially in this moment we're in and what's happening in Ukraine? So to find out, we worked with the Gaming Lab at the Center for a New American Security, CNAS. This is a think tank that specializes in national security. CNAS convened two teams to fight it out here in our Washington studio. The blue team, a group of defense experts, members of Congress, and a retired Air Force general. <laughs> <What's that laughs> on right. the National Security Council advising the United States. Look at how president. serious they're and the red team, this. Nice diversity. China experts uh, and the CEO with the of the salmon CIS sport played jacket. Played part of China's Central Military Commission China advising woman. President I'm sure. Xi Jinping. There's CNAS one Asian drafted person the here. terms of the hypothetical conflict yeah. set five years from now in 2027 with China five years to from launch now, a direct 2027. attack on okay. Taiwan to force you want to pause it real quick after Taiwan yep. had elected new leadership. In okay, so there are a couple of things I kind of want to point out just in this like two and a half minutes. Um, little map that they had of Taiwan, China. There was no um, notation or legend for how far away the island is from that. They just sort of give you a geographic proximity. Uh, I felt, always feel like that's important. No history outside of the Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese Civil War, which ended with the fall of China in 1949. A sort of a convenient ignoring of the um, Taipei communique of 1972, which more or less has been official U.S. policy. Like, yeah, we're, we're pro-democracy, but we also kind of recognize that this is somewhat of an internal matter with the Chinese and that our, our political limitations are going to change it. And then last but not least, uh, 2027. So this is set five years from now. This follows the uh, former Asian uh, or commander of like the Asian um, AMCON or something like that. Uh, Rear Admiral Philip Davidson, who uh, famously coined the term the Davidson window about when he expects the Chinese to act or to have a full sta uh, full scale power peer to peer conflict with the Chinese, specifically over Taiwan. And he had also given a date to 2027. So just those are some things I wanted to throw out there and keep in mind. Okay, yeah, that's good context. I, 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 well, I, I would add something if I may. This is, yeah, my, go ahead. this is my big hot take. I'm just going to go ahead and say it at the outset. As uh, some of you have heard, I believe my working hypothesis, the most satisfactory in terms of its explanatory value, is that this, all this business with Taiwan is fucking bullshit. It's nonsense. There's absolutely no risk of any kind of war happening there. It's never going to happen. This is all bullshit. First off, this is MSNBC, which means it's a shill channel. It's absolutely confirmed over years and years and years as nothing but a regime mouthpiece. So my take, my hot take is that... Uh, the most likely scenario is that Biden is deeply compromised and is working for the Chinese and for himself, getting paid huge amounts of money, as is his crew. All of them are working with the Chinese. I've talked many times about how I think that um, this whole Ukraine thing has basically strengthened China more than any other country, forced Russia into its arms, um, forced Russia to give all kinds of energy guarantees to uh, China. Uh, has reduced the pressure um, between China and Russia vis-a-vis -vis both of them wanting to make paths across Asia to Europe as uh, transit corridors that are not subject to interdiction, whether for ec economics or energy, um, by U.S. or other naval powers. I mean, I've talked about this before. Go check out my Twitter and you'll and do a search for China and Biden and the rest and you'll find it. But the base, basic idea is that MSNBC is a regime fucking, you know, shit spewing mouthpiece. 
Um, Biden does nothing but bark about China all the time. And everybody talks, everybody, there's always all this discussion of how tense everything is. And, you know, Pelosi went to Taiwan and the, and the Chinese were furious. And then McCarthy received some Taiwanese envoys and the Chinese were furious and everything's so tense. But meanwhile, you got Yellen going over there and genuflecting with, you know, her ass in the air, bowing in front of them uh, for what? I don't know, to shore up bond markets. Who knows? Maybe economics people can tell me what that was all about. But the point is, by contrast, the uh, this whole Biden administration is continues to be very, very careful about plausible deniability with Russia. So with a country where it actually is at war is it right now in the act of being at war and pumping out hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, sending equipment, dragging together a whole um, group of countries that are whipped into line in order to support this massive land war in Europe. What's actually happening there? You have Biden being very careful to keep plausible deniability, always say, no, we don't want war with Russia, while doing everything in their power to make war with Russia. Now, again, compare that to this, China, Oh, we might go to war with China. We're, we're, who knows what could happen? You've got all this talking about it. No plausible deniability. Biden will bark in all kinds of statements saying that, you know, t- Taiwan, they'll, they'll absolutely back it up militarily, but they do nothing. The, the arms sales to Taiwan are essentially just going to be high tech equipment for the Chinese to, you know, deconstruct and reverse engineer. And when they do finally take over Taiwan, if indeed they decided it's, it's within their interest to actually do so, because it's a great place for them to funnel and bring money in and out now that they've shut down Hong Kong. If they ever do decide to do that, they'll just China will just end up owning all the weapons that we sent. So that's my take. Bear that in mind as we look at all the rest. Yeah, and I I pretty much agree with everything you said there as well, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, because it's a very good take. All right, here we go. Increasingly defying Chinese pressure. How would the U.S. respond? There were three rounds and a game master from CNAS determining the new reality on the ground after each round. The red team had Wait a the minute, benefit the of fucking D and D dice. The blue team had the benefit of allies and partners. <laughs> Neither team had the edge, <laughs> and that's where we begin. Are those just props? Are they actually using them? As you can see here on the map, is a very large concentration of Chinese People's Liberation Army forces at potential ports of debarkation for an invasion. We want to focus on uh, a last ditch effort to deter. This is a time to be sending the strongest possible message to Beijing, both privately and publicly. Okay, so this is blue team, this is America. If they actually go through with she needs some roving. China has sort of seen our reaction to Ukraine and we want to make sure that, that we're surprising them with how we react here. Hit the Americans as hard as we possibly can in the Western Pacific, keep them out of the this fight while we move on Taiwan. I would support uh, an early knockout punch against Guam. From our point of view, a failed invasion of Taiwan is worse than the risk of conflict with the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, we think that the United States is already going to intervene. And so we have to do a knockout punch before they can neutralize us. Is the assumption that your assault on Guam is going to make the United States pull back? We think it's going to make them militarily less effective. Uh, and so even Look if they at desire this background to music, they like it's capacity, trying to make it tense. Uh, to, uh, to intervene on yeah. behalf of Taiwan. I think we, we start very forcefully with a missile bombardment on Taiwan. I think we want to bring the military to their knees. Are you making an assumption that when that China is going to attack any of the alliance as they attack Taiwan or not? I think China would, doesn't want to. They would like to tell the world that we're going to discipline our unruly province and it's none of your business. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And if we stay out of it, they'll stay out of it. But if we decide to defend Taiwan, they will attack our forces around the region. The priority for the first 24 hours is to. Now, this isn't a year old, and Japan's made more like bold statements on what they would do with Taiwan, but that was a good point. We learned the lessons from Ukraine uh, when the Russians let Zelensky survive uh, and he organized resistance. He got international support uh, and we're not going to let taiwan do the same thing we try to keep japan neutral oh man imagine if russia killed Zelensky like three months early otherwise we know exactly where they're going which is toward taiwan to start shooting at us by by hitting them in the ports you are guaranteeing that japan is getting everything 
I'm not sure that we can. Would you rather take the American uh, military station in Japan out to the greatest degree possible and have J Japan into the conflict or let it steam toward Taipei, attack us, and have Japan maybe stay out of the conflict? Those are the two options. You're going to attack Japan? We are going to attack U.S. facilities on Japan. Uh, so <laughs> U.S. air bases and U.S. ports uh, that the U.S. uses in Japan. We are not yet going after Japanese air bases. Uh, that's not going to bother the Japanese at all. You're not just taking on this little... Well, that guy just folded really quickly. He was arguing pretty strongly that that was a bad idea. And then uh, I guess that other guy was just like, no, nah, it makes sense. Let's just attack them into ports. This just, uh, just we, reminds I mean... me of sitting in meetings with imbeciles. You know, in the corporate world, it's everyone has the, the women all have these like these fucking drink barley water frown lines in their foreheads. You know, we're going to be as mannish and serious as possible. Everyone's trying to act as though it's very grave. And, and McCunt face does that weird hand gesture on the tabletop with his fingers stretched out that people use rhetorically to make it sound as though they're saying something interesting. These people are all freaks. I know this isn't why you had me on. Charlie, but they're just this kind of is why uh, we're losers. on. So to observe this <laughs> all right let's see what they actually well, do you know rogue island that you see is you know we're back to blue team. taiwan you're taking on the united states japan you know australia i'm sort of in the camp of let's be as aggressive as possible short of launching a preemptive strike if that makes sense regardless of which course of action the chinese red team takes here if we are prepared for the bigger fight the potential large strike campaign we are better off than if we assume that there's going to be a blockade or a lower level fight and then suddenly find ourselves in a much bigger war. The insight you see the retired, the retired military guy who's making that, that he's making that face like there's there's deter, only um, the check makes this tolerable. <laughs> fight if they, if deterrence Let's doesn't see. work. Well, you're right. He's the only sane person in right, that see, room see. in a room full of children. I'm... Okay, so, so apparently, apparently like, he, they've made their moves. Good. Oh no! Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was about to say that that senior defense official, like the old white guy in the room, is the only competent person, just overwatching these imbecilic children, knowing that like the country's fucked once they take over. Yeah, uh, who the hell are these people? <laughs> well, they work for they the CNAS, from? the the Center for New American Security. That was founded in like 2007. It was like peak uh global war on terror shit about how to like reanalyze american strategy towards there uh mainly focused on um the indo-pacific region right now uh it works with the military contractor booz allen hamilton um and i think kurt and Campbell, we know about and i think he's the Biden captain. and Boo booz allen what was is, that? uh booz yeah. allen is one of those entities that is not uh not entirely private sector let's just say no also the big like also because this is public i don't assume that this would if if a war were to ever happen and i'm in i'm on team not happening right now if a war was to ever happen anything that was war gamed out for this little public display on um M or nbc ain't gonna fucking happen this is public information everyone sees this we're talking about it that means the chinese have seen it and they want the chinese to see this uh, what a big game of puff up the chest and let's go play D and D, but with millions and millions of dollars. Right, exactly. Uh, all right, let's. Apparently, the first move has happened. So let's see what has happened. High level here. What just happened with move one? China's invaded Taiwan. It began by attacking Taiwan's outlying islands near the mainland. Then it followed it with a large uh, air and missile strike on Taiwan and on U.S. bases in Japan, and on U.S. bases in Guam and the Northern Marianas. In response to that, the United States followed up with bomber attacks on, US on Chinese ships in port, and there was an air battle over Taiwan where American aircraft flying from the Philippines came in and um, engaged in combat with Chinese aircraft that were trying to bomb Taiwan. So after move one, can you assess which team is winning? I think it's a stalemate right now. Uh, China has strategically blundered by pulling Japan in, and the United States is still well positioned to defend, but China also has a lot of its assets left and has a lot of power that it can apply. Okay, China quick question, quick, very, question. Very quick question. I'm, yep. I'm old now. Um, so... 
the the person who's I, I don't know maybe that woman with the beetling forehead that looks like fucking night on bald mountain maybe she's older than me and the 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 military sellout guy there on the top right but all the rest of these people I, i'm not exaggerating they're like imbecile children they're all like starbucks employees who who put on their best clothes to get dressed up for this no one has any idea what they're talking about like just just the basic idea that oh well uh, aircraft flew from the philippines and they engaged <laughs> yeah. in air combat over taiwan with uh, with chinese aircraft what about area and access denial and air defense systems like do we really believe that there's going to be a a battle for britain between aircraft over taiwan it's stupid everything is stupid these people are stupid yeah and uh these are the kinds of people making decisions about the war in ukraine right now but this is what the, actually this is a good point that you just brought up charlemagne because i want to ask since prude follows this right prude is very prude keeps up on white papers and different organizations and who's a member of them and when they were founded and what they're connected to right are you telling me prudentialist that the people who were hired by msnbc for this war game that's what you were just talking about with like booze allen and the rest right this actually these are think tank people yeah this is they said this at the beginning this is for the center of new american security um and right, they, right. But, they were but, founded but they could, yeah they could claim Go that ahead. right they could claim any kind of name but is this really an organization that's taken seriously inside the beltway or whatever uh they make quite a bit of money and one of the i, I just looked up to confirm it their co-founder works in the biden administration specifically on indo-pacific issues so yeah, oh, uh, these guys wow. are, are taken seriously. This is a year old, so all of this doesn't mean shit anymore because America doesn't have the ammunition it had a year ago. <laughs> it, is, right. it is after the war in Ukraine started, though. Um, we can note. Yes. Um, what What do you guys think about the Chinese attacking the American ports in Japan? I mean, that seems insane to me. The idea that the Chinese would do that and also do these really long-range attacks against Guam and other places. I mean, that... That seems a little ridiculous. I, I feel like they're projecting American thinking on the on the, the Chinese. I don't know. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear what Prude uh, says. But, uh, but but again, my take is that this isn't China's way. They don't do this. This isn't. No, this would, well, that's kind of, of the point. Ever that, that was exactly. These my are thought. Westerners trying to think as Chinese people. Exactly. This, this is like this is basically America versus America. And it's not at all what it claims to be. Uh, Oh, retard, retarded America versus retarded <laughs> right. America. Let's, uh, let's, let's continue. <laughs> the, the thing, though, about, about Japan is that I think that they would actually strike them because... You do. You have to keep it... I, I do, because you have to keep in mind two things. Uh, Japan has been increasingly militarized since Shinzo Abe, and the guy that succeeded him as prime minister was his former defense minister. They still have been trying to push for a more militarized push, uh, Japan's deputy defense minister, Yashuri Nakayama, said in June, I think of 21 or 22, I don't remember, uh, said that if China did attack Taiwan, they would assist the United States in defending it. And they've been engaging in large scale military exercises since then with American and Australian partners. Uh, I, if something were to bow down here uh, again, team not happening gang here. But if something were to happen, uh, Japan and Australia are definitely getting drawn into it in they're going to get fucked just as much as uh, um, Taiwan, maybe not by munitions, but definitely by economic pressures. And and uh, to to um, to reinforce Prude's point about Taiwan, everybody has to understand. I know you guys know it, but uh, Japan has invested mightily, and and, and probably uh, in in the the top tier, certainly the top three, maybe the top itself. I've not looked at the numbers, but. Taiwan is basically where all the high tech uh, Japanese electronic investment went, you know, but from, from the days when I was a kid, when, you know, Korea was not a place where you got dishwashers or cars, you know, when everything came from Japan um, and, and Sony was the big tech, like Japan sort of disappeared from our awareness as a primary source of uh, the best consumer electronics and was re replaced. But 
The thing is that, and I only learned this in the last couple of years, Japan invested enormously in Taiwan. And of course, Taiwan was once a part of the Japanese co-prosperity sphere, you know, South Asian or whatever, Asian uh, co-prosperity sphere. And uh, Taiwan was a colony of Japan where uh, quite um, out of keeping with how the Japanese normally um, behaved in their uh, possessions abroad, they treated everyone very well. Uh, and it was sort of the jewel in the crown of the uh, Japanese uh, imperial possessions. And so Japan is heavily invested there. I think they just did some stuff with a, um, what is it, elevated rail? Uh, no, I'm sorry, bullet trains that they're they're um, investing in to uh, develop stuff in Taiwan. So yeah, Japan is massively invested there. And so the the economic... Uh, requirements, you know, in terms of the people with real money in Japan who would push to intervene and get involved. Um, I think that, yeah, they would get involved, except it's, ne it's not going to be necessary because, you know, again, a team, uh, team China ain't going to do anything like this. But one other further point to reinforce what Prude said is that there are a number of really, really tiny islands, increasingly tiny islands that run off the south of Japan. And they come, the last of them, within a very short distance from the northern tip of, uh, of, of Taiwan. And the Japanese have been moving there and have been looking at um, uh, missile defense systems as emplacements there. So yeah, the, the Japanese are involved. And the very idea, see, th this is the kind of crap that these people in these uh, television programs don't talk about. Japan's going to be involved from the start because they're one of the biggest stakeholders in terms of financial investment in semiconductors and chip manufacturing and all the other kinds of shit that's going on in Taiwan. So these people talk about like, well, would Japan get involved? They're not even discussing the fact that economically they'd have, they're already involved. Anyway, yeah, those are my points. Sorry. All right, let's see what they do in turn to war has strike started. campaign against U.S. forces and bases throughout the region. The gloves are off, if you if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, by attacking U.S. territory of Guam, this killing mean, Americans, the Chinese march. have crossed the line. Um, I think they've also gang. miscalculated already that they, they took some actions against U.S. forces in Japan that they thought would maybe prevent Japan from coming in. It actually drew Japan in. Same with Australia. How do we prevent She's one of the, founders the, the Chinese of that Force that's tank. trying to get across the Strait of Taiwan to, to actually be able to successfully land and start um, taking Taiwanese territory. Now this is just a matter of getting as many things into the fight as we can as quickly as possible. Getting the Australians involved in a blockade and checking out what's in the Strait with the Marine Little Regiment subs that rely on our allies to watch the rear and maintain supply lines and maybe implement a blockade while we're fighting in the Strait. In the <laughs> this guy. The <laughs> guy takes uh the less able we will be able to uh achieve our objectives and so we are in in the course of this building in fallback positions although uh we tell that to the other team move two is building on all of that mm -hmm. and moving forward to land on taiwan to further try to take out uh american assets in the region and also to go after japan which has entered the war the fact that they aggressively hit guam and japan uh, was frankly um, just a very quick way to make sure our allies were all in. And now we have Japanese resources willing to contribute to air and undersea. We have Australians willing to con contribute and others coming on board. And my sense is that we need to at least take out the airfields in uh, northern Australia, or at least try to. So like Darwin and Tyndall? Darwin and Tyndall. Um, the fuel tanks are very important because that's how those planes get refueled. And the runways are important because it needs to be <laughs> Oh my god. In Hawaii, you have... Wow. He just said run, runways are important, important. because <laughs> that's how the planes take them. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> it's just Whoa. like every fucking shitty meeting that I've had in corporate Landia with like, you know, the diverse staff and like, you know, the person, just like we see in the, the, the meetings there, there was that one guy who like has the laptop open in front of him and kind of hides behind it. You know, and, and um, Mr. Salmon Jacket, fuck off. Uh, yeah, okay, I brought the Raging Mandrel in, who is joining the chat. And, uh, yeah, Marcus is uh, not going to make it, but we have Mandrel instead. Um, so, uh, do you want to say anything at this point? You've been watching a little bit. 
uh, other than just just laughing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's uh... all right. Let, let's continue turn two then. American territory, which they seek to preserve. Plus, you have uh, all of the naval and air assets that the Americans have dispersed back that way once this war started. So there's a lot of targets out there. They hit our ports in China. We're going to take the fight to Hawaii. I'm a little bit hesitant what? to use conventional kinetic attacks in Hawaii just because I feel that will be interpreted as a Pearl Harbor in the United States. Yep. We could galvanize significant U.S. support. China's big strike, which was in response to the U.S. Uh, attacking its ports, was on Hawaii. And they launched uh, their stealth bombers, and which launched cruise missiles and hypersonic weapons against Hawaii. They it fucking wish they could have on Hickam Air Force Base, um, where they're controlling uh, blue air forces and commanding the air war. So an American state has now been attacked. What was the blue team's move? The blue team uh, was focused on destroying China's big warships that provide a lot of air defense for the invasion fleet. So they had submarines within the strait. I would say right now the red team is ahead. They're starting to make progress towards their objective mm -hmm. of actually okay, so gaining we're, we're control. We're the of public, doing exactly what this thing is for. Got it. <clears throat> yes, and and and. Uh, talking up the capabilities of the uh, the Chinese, the idea that anybody could cruise all that distance to Hawaii. Uh, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but just to like, you know, blithely say their stealth bombers struck Hawaii. That's a yeah. lot of empty blue water to cross to, to hit that target. China notably does, does not have the uh, underway replenishment capability that the United States or many of the Western countries does. Um, their, their Navy is regionally focused for a reason. Yeah, yeah it was, a, it was what, what they call it, a brown water Navy or whatever, as recently as green. 10 years ago. Oh, okay. You talked about it in the past. Brown water is India's Navy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. India does have Kilo-class submarines. They, they are blue and water Navy. So what, what do you make uh, about the submarines of the Taiwan Strait taking out their uh, their ships? Do you think that's uh, something that could reasonably happen in this scenario? I mean, it's logical. We've got a bunch there. Although, although why would you... So, so the modern naval warfare has... Um, you know, if you think about... Um, you know, the weapons triangle, right? That everybody's played in video games of like... Especially in Fire Emblem, like spear versus sword versus axe naval warfare works kind of similarly um where air assets are good against surface ships but also they're good against submarines they're like especially good against submarines um because they can uh, <clears throat> they're faster so they can cross more distances quicker they can drop a lot of like things like sona buoys and things and <clears throat> um you know, a lot of submarines for because if you're submerged, you, you don't have the ability to to fire missiles back, right? So, um, y so most aircraft are are going to be way good against submarines comparatively. Um, whereas surface ships are basically bullet sponges for the most part. Okay, let's see what happens next. Over Taiwanese territory, mm -hmm. um, but they have a long, hard slog in front of them. After move one, you said we were at a stalemate. After move two, what would you say? I would say that China has a slight advantage right now mm -hmm. because it's actually ashore. Um, uh, the, so it has made progress towards achieving its objective. It still has a long way to go, but both sides are probably running low of some of the key missiles and munitions that they right. use. So the character of the fight might change going forward. All right. On the move well, that's well yeah, saying. since we've just spent so much ammunition right that in means that Ukraine. The US or the West would back down. I wonder if yeah, we know that the US is running low not over, sure. but near I mean, where oh the oh US and the US forces and are. And and shit. Clear and shot nuclear explosion at high altitude. <laughs> but obviously, we'd want, wouldn't want it right over in this area at this point. So you're saying a demonstration explosion? Yeah. The hard part is is that China could reasonably get all of the ex-Soviet. I think Naval. that depends on folks in the room, but I think that's the stuff we got to worry about. Locating Taiwan scenario, if we are really in, in, facing the prospect of the feet, we should be willing to use nuclear weapons. It might not be nuclear weapons on Taiwan; it could be a tactical nuclear weapons invading U.S. or intervening U.S. forces. A real big weakness is our inability to contest 
or, or threaten China's air superiority. We keep trying, but the difficulty is in our dispersed posture with limited access to tankers, we're not able to push enough tactical aviation forward over Taiwan to really maintain persistent air security or even just contest Chinese air security. I think the, the That's why you don't attack Taiwan. You don't is, contest Taiwan. You, you attack them where they're weak in the Malacca Strait, as I've said this, before. Pre-positioning munitions, getting the Taiwanese ready, mm -hmm. pre-positioning your own forces, developing your dispersal bases. If you haven't spent years preparing for this, then you're going to be behind the eight ball the whole way. How about putting a bunch of seals on the island um, huh? by submarines and try to support the Marines? The biggest concern is that the United States will come roaring back with everything it has, not over a short period of time, but a long period of time. We have calculated that America's in and America's in. Mm -hmm. uh, but there may be gradations of what it means for America to, to fight our country. And uh, we have seen time and time again, once the enraged bull elephant is fully stirred, right. its ability to make war and to generate the resources to make war is, this, is, is this guy unbelievably large. Citing World War II mythology to, to me. To declare Dear God. On is yeah. Really, really long wars. He was adding a little bit of. Uh of a touch of uh, uh, cinema verite or something you know the idea that we we would use the same language that they would use in referring to us and thinking of us this bridge out here uh just like in ukraine it's not going to be over in a few days unless taiwan capitulates if you watch what happened in ukraine you know the actions that were taken before the invasion were important but so has continued resupply Ukraine, Neither of these conflicts are remotely comparable. Taiwan's a long way. No, so. not at all. So here we are after like, move this is three, just retarded. blue team, the United. Okay, so today, what did they talk they about take... there? They Sorry, talked about I... red. Red team mentioned the idea of detonating a nuke at high altitude just as a demonstration, which that they're willing to okay. use nukes. Yeah, uh, that's uh, then... that's part of French French military doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is it? That's interesting. Uh, I didn't know that. And uh, probably the most interesting thing to come out of Blue Team is this idea of using their submarines to land Navy SEALs on the beaches to support uh, the Taiwanese, which seems kind of ineffective. So Yeah, all 50 or 100 of them. Yeah, so, like what is the small point of that? You, get, okay, you don't um, even have a division's worth of, of special forces that could do that. Like you have maybe a Well, yeah, it's just like let's just, let's just spend all of our special forces <laughs> in some like weird amphibious landing to like help quote unquote um all what, right what, did they mention because the biggest thing that i see right now is okay so they're already talking of, oh we're going to put our submarines here but but why why would you send in one naval asset that isn't supported by others like this is the where combined arms warfare really really shines and if you only send in one asset okay you don't have air superiority. You just said that you don't have the ability to knock out the Chinese air arm. So why would the Chinese not just simply say, okay, well, we'll hold our MARPATs in reserve and we'll just use propeller fixed wing aircraft and helicopters to knock out all of the submarines that you've sent. Because it's you're, a bunch of, need... uh, it's, it's a bunch of journalists and humanities degrees, people and women. All of yeah. this is is smoke and mirrors. This is this is yeah. If you could see the trumpets that they stick into each other's butts in Bosch paintings, th this is the sound that comes out of those trumpets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, but, but uh, more to the point, right? Did they even mention for the American Atlantic Fleet for for Second Fleet, right, and all the all the ships that are in in other areas? Did they mention how long it would take for those? assets to actually get on station in the south china sea because if they're no, if they they're mentioned even... a little bit about having problems with their tankers but they haven't mentioned anything about the actual logistics of uh, any of these yeah. units this this is how you know these people aren't serious and because you're telling me okay so you have all of this these submarine assets that you're going after taiwan no no no, no. tell me about mass what forces are you massing in the south china sea to just say, okay, China, I have more numbers than you in this one specific region, and I win because I have more numbers than you in, in the Taiwanese Strait, and I just BTFO you because I have more people and more ships. Um, that's how you win, right? It, and the problem is if you're not talking about what, what's the timeline to get the Atlantic fleet through the Panama Canal 
into the Pacific, either to San Diego or to Pearl or to Everett, Washington, whatever port you, you pick in order to concentrate forces before you launch them west. Um, you're just not serious at all. And also they're talking about like Chinese cruise missiles flying about here. Most of all of the navies that our allies use in the South China Sea area, including our own, all use the um, what Aegeus uh, ballistic missile defense capabilities that are all there. Um, Aegis, like most yeah, of our like Aegis. USS Lake, yeah, Aegis, like the USS Lake Champlain, the Ticonderoga class, the USS Bunker Hill, like all these oh, ships are well, there. Not, not the Lake for... Champlain, actually. Not the Lake okay. Champlain. The Lake but, like, Champlain these are, is getting these are... this year, but yes. Okay, but those like type of craft, right? Those are the ones that are being deployed for ballistic missile defense. Like this is what we sell to our allies to stop cruise missiles. Uh, like none of this is being, again, it's all puff and smoke and mirrors up people's butts, but like unbelievable that this is what we got to deal with as agitprop. All right, so let's see what happened on turn three. The United States seemed to increase, try to do what it could to make command and control more difficult in the actual invasion itself of Taiwan and all of that. Uh, China and the red team wanted to send more of a message to the United States, uh, attempting to strike Alaska and California, San Diego specifically, plus Hawaii again. So escalation everywhere, including a nuclear test uh, to be sent by China to essentially um, make the United States take the nuclear uh, option more seriously. So where are we now? All right. So they detonated a nuke off the coast of Washington somewhere, a couple hundred miles, and then they attacked California and Alaska with something. More cruise San missiles? San Diego because of the naval facility. So we're getting Fallout 3 lore. <laughs> Things spiraled really quickly. The The headline is the nuclear oh, test, shit. which is oh, unprecedented shit. since uh, World War II. We haven't seen limited nuclear oh, she's so excited. during combat. The nukes are flying now. They're happy. From here. Mm -hmm. um, there were also the attempted strikes at the, on the United States. Uh, China has continued to reinforce its lodgment on Taiwan, mm. but it's still very small and it's heavily contested. The U.S. is pushing in some of its um, ships now that munition stockpiles what? have gone down right. to try ships. to support them. And it looks like we're in for just a ships, long, man. hard fight. Just, so, just, just ships. Just ships. ships. Scenario the United States has less than 10 ships in Hawaii. I can Worst case scenario that. is we're, we're starting to have some nuclear It takes change. at least a month yes. to get across. China still area. has um, uh, its intercontinental ballistic missiles that are nuclear armed, but mm -hmm. it also has the ones that can range Guam and um, sort of this area that it could use, which have uh, nuclear weapons. And um, well, there are a lot of sort of this area. This. this was fascinating. <laughs> I can't wait to get to the lessons learned. Oh, my can God. we do that in a little bit? Wait. Thank you, Stacey. Thank wait, you. Wait, is that it? We're, so we're getting to the lessons learned? I didn't like, learn anything. You're not even going to say, oh, hey, what, what happens if the United States loses an, an entire carrier strike group in the first two weeks? because that's what probably would happen. States. And then you'd have to have the, the Pacific fleet engage. And then what happens if in the, if third fleet and seventh fleet combine and fight a battle in the South China Sea, what happens for second fleet and, and all of the sixth fleet and all of the other fleets that have assets coming in? Like you're, you're not gonna discuss, discuss that, really? Hopefully we get a, 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 a made up casualty count. We still have 10 minutes left, so there's still a lot of content here. Uh, let, let's see what he says, I guess. And at the end of three moves, so are the costs on both sides of this fight, which is why avoiding war altogether may be in both countries' best interest. We're going to talk <laughs> over that and other key takeaways well, in this game. 10 minutes more bed to crap. Okay. Welcome back. After the exercise wrapped, I sat down with Dr. Stacy Pettyjohn, our game master and the director of the defense program at CNAI, to talk about the results. Dr. And we were joined Pettyjohn. by two players from each team. From the blue team were the two members of Congress, Mike Gallagher, Republican, Wisconsin. Oh, and those Mike guys are Michelle, actually congressmen. New Jersey. Wow. And from the red team, yeah. it was oh, Lane, the director of the China oh, Power fuck. Project That's at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And Joel, what's that? That looks like Sean Connery. A senior research fellow they at the They didn't include the former defense. military guy. Stacey, I want to start with you. What did you learn? She's the game master? What the hell? I thought she was just some random presenter. She doesn't sound like she knows. You know, she, she's, she's there at the at the um, 
CNAS. Also, that Michelle Florine lady, one of the founders. Here's the fun bit here. She's also one of the founders of Westec Exe Advisors LLC, um, which is all former Obama people, but including the now current Secretary of State, a Antony Blinken. Um, and so they're uh, they're they're a lobbyist and foreign agent to help re-enter government service without delays. So like this is all part of the Obama era foreign policy political machine that is still a large role in directing this current compromised administration with its Indo-Pacific affairs. I feel like oh, I need to boy. drink more. Let's see. I think I was surprised by how quickly things escalated and the fact that the blue team didn't really seem to believe the red team's threats about nuclear use. Gotta believe that the Chinese how, are gonna attack us, you know? That, that didn't seem to be honored. They, escalated. It, it seemed to me that they thought that they yep. were bluffing and oh, they were willing the, to call that bluff. God. Uh, Joel, I would say that going, the plan going in, I remember you explaining to me, we're gonna go in quickly. We're gonna go in with a with with big force uh and we're gonna end this quickly that big happen. force we're, we're gonna go in with big force um we sacrifice <laughs> a lot um i was unsatisfied that we weren't able to take out taiwan's president uh, early in the game uh, and so we had to move harder um throughout the game we paid a big price but ultimately i don't think we lost I'm what 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 is the reasoning for taking out the taiwanese president like why would they do that why would they need to yeah, it uh, doesn't really. I mean, there's a reason Russia hasn't done that with Zelensky because that escalates things to a totally unnecessary level, uh, and it doesn't really it accomplishes nothing militarily either. It's kind of like yeah, and you you, uh, exchange you know the terror bombing campaigns, for, and you exchange a known quantity for an unknown one. It's just yeah. stupid. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and why would you waste a, a, a even more valuably a, a million dollar or million and a half or two million dollar precision guided missile with a range of, you know, thousands or hundreds of miles, depending on which missile you're using? Why would you waste that asset on something like a president when you can spend it on a general's headquarters or something? You know, when you can actually get a real disruption in enemy military capability? Anyway. I think we got the foothold that we wanted mm -hmm. and we'll get the prize but we will have paid an enormous cost in blood and treasure to have gotten it bonnie do you the the decision to target japan is that is that going to be with assuming this war is drawn out in this mm -hmm. scenario is that going to be a, an initial mistake or miscalculation from the red team of the chinese side i don't see that as a miscalculation uh, one of the things that we discussed during the team is of the U.S. allies and partners, which U.S. ally partner we knew would be involved in the conflict. And we were most certain that regardless of what the scenario was, if it was a crisis or major conflict in Taiwan, Japan would be there to support the United States. So for us, the calculation was, do we want to take out the assets in Japan now while they're still relatively easier to target? Or do we want to wait later when it was much more difficult to strike Japan and uh, knowing either way that Japan would be in the fight with the United States. So they went with a Wait, preempt, this, preemptive again, strike. It, it, again, when did this video come out? Because you, you guys are younger. Do, 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 is there the same weird like sense of unreality where they all have Kool-Aid mustaches? Like these people are <laughs> fucking idiots. Like they're all incompetent. <laughs> like not they're one of them knows fucking anything. These people are all morons. You're absolutely right, Timmy. Like, like these are the I, I'm people. St I'm stunned. I'm stunned by the stupidity. Like, I I can't believe how retarded these people are. Uh, Charlie, when did this video come out? It says one year ago in the video description. I'll uh I'll check it uh, afterwards. Okay, because that that Bonnie Lynn that the the one the the token yellow right here. Um, she's part of CSIS, the strategic, or the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She wrote or was a big part of the writing um of this uh um the battle for the next war the war gaming chinese invasion of taiwan which came out in january of 2023 a lot of her research was used by the authors of that war game report so like she's already been doing this this is part of her job and we're just getting like baby's first version of war gaming as if like we're a 12 year and what's worse is the 12 year old boys who got George, uh, you know, HG Wells's war gaming uh, instructions could probably fight a better war than these guys. 
But now tell me this, tell me this. So, so that I'm not just blathering and being unfair since you're familiar with, uh, with write-ups of, of, uh, you know, war gaming scenarios and their potential outcomes that, as you say, relied heavily upon this woman's work. Is she as bad in writing as she is on camera? Well, no, she's better in writing, uh, so I would, I, I guess this is different because like this is for the press. This is NBC News. This isn't the white papers and the analysis that we've got on there. And so her work has been cited. Um, I think it's like the War Game Report by, by these like three white guys. And the, the summary of the CSIS uh, report was a war game with an Chinese amphibious invasion of, tai, of, of Taiwan. They ran it 24 times with different scenarios. Um the defense, of course, comes at a high cost with tens of thousands of casualties. I don't know if they're going to talk about that. I know we've got some time in this video still, but um, they're they're just talking about nukes and high uh, atmospheric explosions to generate EMPs and hitting California and Hawaii with no with nothing to show for it. So what and, a, what and these are people piece. who don't they don't understand go. Now, I'm not claiming I understand Go, but I've been working on it quite a bit recently, the game, and the way in which you surround, the way in which you contain, the way in, in which those contained closed spaces with their living eyes work, the way in which you have to run in parallel and attempting to surround, and then you capture the other stones. Play Go. And all of this just is revealed as the clusterfuck, you know, butt rumpery that it is. It's just no, no one would. That's not how they think. That's read the Tao, read the the Art of War. They don't think this way. We should play Go online. That would be fun. Um, but yeah, you're right. One one of the big things, one of the big takeaways here is this is just Westerners on both sides. The the red team is really making no effort to actually think by the china like the chinese now to be fair we're seeing a highly summarized version of the war game that probably took hours and hours but i'm not really seeing i'm not seeing anything that uh tells us that these people are actually uh thinking about these numbers at all uh, like what are the casualties how are these resources actually moving around the time like mandrel said the timeline for moving these ships uh it would be interesting to know more about what's going on there but I guess let's let's see what else they have to say. Essentially on Japan, you guys debated and it's my understanding there was a little bit of debate on that first move. Should should the U.S. side be more aggressive? Explain. Well, uh, you know, obviously, I think particularly if China's pursuing a fait accompli strategy, mm -hmm. uh, the quicker that goes, the more they're actually able to establish facts on the ground in Taiwan, the more difficult it is for us to react to that, right? The same thing that makes that Taiwan like a difficult Henry. problem geographically for the Chinese to solve makes it very difficult for us to, to resupply. So <clears> if we weren't <throat> going to do a preemptive strike because we wanted the moral authority that came from responding to an attack on us, we at least wanted to be ready to start taking out their ships while they were in port, while they were transiting across the strait. And I think, I mean, the lesson for me is just how costly deterrence failures are. I mean, we've come accustomed to sort of low intensity conflict over the last two decades if this happens, I mean, a lot of people are going to lose their life, which is why we want deterrence to actually work and which is why we need hard power in yeah. place prior to the conflict breaking out. You know, uh, Mickey Cheryl, I was... We need more missiles. Some <laughs> other country has air superiority over anything. <laughs> we're the United States of America, but obviously yeah. we're a lot closer to their mainland there. That was, to me, a surprise that we could not establish air superiority over Taiwan. No shit. Well, certainly, I think no what we've been saying. Yeah, I was not <laughs> surprised at all. <laughs> no shit. Oh, you can't yeah, establish air superiority where somebody uh, has an air defense bubble. Is the fact bubble. that God. we see China's growing predominance in certain areas and catching up very, very quickly mm -hmm. to uh, yeah, what because you have a bunch of spies and you're really presuming superiority in military matters by the United States. Oh, and what was so helpful to both of us was to, you know, to be at the table for this war game so that when we do make decisions 
for this country, when we are looking at how we modernize our military and, and where we strategically use the, the taxpayer resources that were given most effectively, um, that we're thinking about uh, how to really, as Mike said, how to make sure this never happens. How do we make sure that we are Why able are to present such a credible threat across thing? the world right. that we never actually have to go into a hot war like this? Bonnie, you were saying Only one thing we just don't know is what the Chinese like taxpayer it, dollars it, and the, resources what the red team derived the decision making process was <laughs> yeah. through the writing of, most of the army of the Chinese army, mm -hmm. and you were very, um, you know, stuck to that script. What do you suspect they are going to take away from Russia's essentially failed attempt to do what the Chinese strategy for your, your Laugh, Chinese strategy to do asshole. here was, which is to end, <laughs> you know take Taiwan quickly? That was the Russian strategy. It didn't work for them, and it didn't work for the Chinese. So you I see that China fucking hand that gesture? What doing Ukraine. Yes, I saw it. Yeah, puts his fucking fingers on the tabletop to pretend. I, I forgive me. Parentheses. I was told by some old timers way back when of the Anglo variety, not not of course from Britain, but you know, waspy Americans, that you weren't supposed to talk with their hands, uh, with your hands. Like they 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 absolutely looked down on anyone who gestured as they spoke, unless it was to like you know. To, to, to point with a with an indicator on a map or something where it was required. All of this hand-waving bullshit needs to stop. Everyone on the right should put their hands in their lap as they speak, uh, lest they be mistaken for Italians. <laughs> Based. Right. And they don't see the Russian failure as directly applicable to the PLA because of the differences in how Russia invaded Ukraine versus how China plans yeah, for Taiwan. So one thing I think China is going to take away is as exactly like what we did with the war game was uh, China is going to try to move much faster on Taipei decapitation and focus up concentrate its forces on Taipei. One other thing that China is taking away is the extent to which nuclear uh, Russia's nuclear signaling deterred the United States and NATO from going into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the Chinese believe necessarily are confident that nuclear weapons will deter the United States from intervening to help Taiwan, but China is going to invest in its nuclear capabilities and will likely play up nuclear signaling in a Taiwan conflict. You know, Joel, Michelle Flournoy told me after one of the debriefs, after uh, after one of the moves, that she was surprised that, that the Chinese fired the first shot at first, meaning her assumption was they would just slowly move their ships, basically go as close as they could without ever firing a shot. Uh, and then all of a sudden, oh, what are we going to do? They're at the front door of Taiwan. Well, I think in, in reality, what would happen is that China may indeed use a large scale exercise as the cover for an actual invasion, much mm -hmm. as Russia has tried to do this. I also think that China will be better at Russia. I think they will do large scale exercises year over year over year and make it very difficult for us in the U.S. side to determine what is an exercise and what would be the actual uh, invasion. Uh, that being said, uh, from our point of view, we have to uh, establish air and maritime superiority, which means that we have to fire the first shot. Stacy, what is uh, the, the idea that Okay, yeah, he was the Chinese scene, so, okay. That makes I feel like sense. we're very familiar with Russia's um, aspiration to use tactical nukes. Where are the Chinese right <laughs> Their now? Their aspiration in front? And, and to uh, use tactical nukes. Years, they aspire who to be who aspires it. to use nukes? I don't know. What does that even mean? <laughs> nukes tactically? Other people at this table are probably better positioned to answer this than me, but no, their doctrine is explicitly no first use. But a lot of people are beginning to question that because their nuclear posture is changing and they're expanding their arsenal so much. They're yeah, let's just do first strike. Weapons oh and new God. types of weapons where some of oh those God, medium and intermediate die. range ballistic <laughs> missiles that they used in the game, they can uh, also carry nuclear China's weapons. Going on new so my biggest <laughs> takeaway and She's I want to save this last question for the two of you because you're you're the elected. Do you think this gets her wet to, to try to do this? We need an Asian NATO. We need an Asian it is NATO. Clear we need <laughs> Did you just did you, did you see right when he said oh. that the 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 female uh, quote unquote lawmaker did a big gulp? You can watch her Adam's apple bob. You can see her post gulp <laughs> face right there. Oh man, what a thing to say! The assets we have. There it is. Yeah, no, I saw the gold. Ukraine, and so quickly. Whether it's Slovakia, whether it's in Poland, there's not as many assets. That's what I learned from this. Can we do it? Well, certainly, we have a lot of friends um, 
in the Indo-PACOM region. And we spoke about some of our allies today, and I think there were some other uh, allies in the region that maybe would have been a bit more helpful than was presented in the scenario. Korea, may, Korea would be the- Korea, the, South Korea. Uh, um, the biggest one. But I, I do think um, there's a discussion to be had about making, uh, about doing more outreach here, doing more diplomacy here. There has been a hesitancy because of China's economic predominance. I'm wondering now, Mickey? as we look at what's just happened with Ukraine, if some of our allies in the region aren't more willing to become, um, to form a stronger partnership yeah. with each other and with the United States um, to ensure that that they don't so face they some of these threats. You know, uh, Mike, yeah, that's what it sounds Mickey. like, doesn't it? Like, that's really all that they want here, is they want a form of Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, which ended, what, right after we left Vietnam and everyone was like, okay, fuck this, and they left? Like, uh, okay, who's interested? Like, we can't... We've already threatened India with sanctions, and they still buy a lot of Russian military equipment, and we have to walk a fine line with them because they buy cheap ch Russian oil, and they're just trying to get their own posturing set up correctly with the Chinese. Uh, do we inspire confidence to any Asiatic partner Fuck in no. the region? No. Like, no, even, no. The t even the Taiwanese have said, if we were to say scorched earth, bomb you know, the Taiwanese <clears throat> semiconductor manufacturing company, they outright said they'd shoot us down. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? Yeah, plus they, they, they want to do business. I mean, I hate to sound like Steve Bannon, but, you know, Confucian mercantilist, right? Mercantilism. They, the, the Asians want to do business, and they can win that way because they're playing Go. They're not playing, like, these people can't even play chess. It's, 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 it's laughable. Yeah, once again, complete misunderstanding. That'd be a misunderstanding. It's like it's a black hole of understanding about how these countries even operate on a basic level. And these are the a, people a who are supposed a, to be making the policy decisions. Literally, a it's a black hole. Yeah. <laughs> Gallagher, the I, I go back to the decision by both essentially leaders of the of the political parties in 2016 to walk away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm. This was going to be essentially what could have been step one in creating a, 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 West, a, a Western or a small D democratic umbrella in Asia. We didn't do it. Is it possible to, what, what, how do we do it now? Well, we may have to start with uh, certain bilateral agreements and put aside sort of the economic agreements. I think we have an urgent need for more basing agreements in the region. And that became very apparent throughout the war game. Uh, we had three treaty allies that were involved in the conflict, but we still struggled to project power where we needed to project it. We quickly in the game clarified the policy of strategic ambiguity. Uh, we suggested that the president make it explicit that we would def defend Taiwan. That's something we need to reexamine in Congress, I think, to uh, very quickly, because we can't wait two weeks, three weeks of Congress mm -hmm. isn't in session to have the debate and potentially give the president the authority he needs to defend Taiwan. So there are ways we can make progress, even though a big regional trade agreement is probably not likely in the short term. We'll, we'll make progress by I clarifying say, strategic ambiguity. I, I learned a lot, and um, <laughs> I hope some of the knowledge I learned we never have to actually use on air. No offense, guys. Yeah, uh, I'm sure but, he uh, hopes they for, never have to this a bit smarter. go to war. He'd we know how much That's all we have that. for this episode of Meet the Press Reports. Thanks for being here. And this is the end of our spring. All right, shut up. We had enough of that. Now. Okay. Well, that was quite something. Yeah. Not encouraging. Yeah. You have no, to, it, all, it of you, all of you, all of you have to live with it longer than I do. It I was remarkable how, uh, how much lit black substance. I mean, there was nothing to grab onto in there. Uh, there, there was, Nothing meaningful was said in that entire video. Uh, these people no. have no idea what they're doing. And that's what's no. that's kind of horrifying to me. And I account for it. Perhaps you guys can tell me what your view is. I account for it by imagining that it, the only hypothesis I can assume is that people who are cunning put imbeciles in power because it suits them. But it, it may be I'm going to have to reassess that and maybe everyone is asleep at the wheel they really are idiots everyone i mean what do you think yeah i mean these uh these think tank policy makers the the unelected bureaucrats i mean they're the ones who are supposed to be actually putting out these reports for the idiots in congress to make decisions on uh 
so and you know they seem pretty stupid i mean obviously this is the, the one selected for us to see this this whole thing we have to remember is just a bunch of propaganda um in order to you know get the american civilians to be ever more gung-ho about you know going to war with china just like they're you china know, having, yeah with china so it is it is propaganda we have to keep that in mind but these people don't inspire confidence and as the Prudentialist was telling us, uh, these are people with significant uh, political appointments. They're not just randos, right? And I think one of them was the head of one of these think tanks, if I recall. Yeah, you had the CEO, uh, the founder in there, and then the other co-founder of this think tank works in the Biden administration right now for Pacific Indo or Indo-Pacific Affairs. So, like, this is what we're dealing with here. And this is, and like, they're talking about strategic ambiguity. Like, they know, we all know in a heartbeat that the U.S. would probably do so. I mean, either as a knee-jerk reaction, not to lose face on things, but because the entire political class has been talking about China as the greater civilizational threat to America. And now when they're talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, let's go back in time to, say, 10, 12 years ago. Every book that you saw in like a Barnes and Noble area about the United States and China were books like When China Rules the World, What to Do About China, China Incorporated. Uh, and so this Trans-Pacific Partnership was pushed in a lot of ways. And see, I'm glad I have my camera off because I'm gesticulating with my hands. Sorry, Semi Agog, I'm a spiritual Mediterranean. But um, it's indicative of Irish. the fact... Uh, you fuck off. Um <laughs> On one side of my family. But anyways, um, the point being is, is that the Trans-Pacific Partnership was seen as sort of this like, I hate to use the word, but like this sort of neoliberal enveloping to bring all parties together to sort of like continue this idea that if we can liberalize markets, we can somehow get China to be more amicable to us. The TPP was awful for a variety of reasons, not just because of shitty foreign policy assumptions, but it was really bad for American workers. Uh, so thankfully, Trump killed that in the campaign, even forced Hillary Clinton to say it's a bad idea. Um, so they want to like return to this concept. They basically want Southeast uh, Asian Treaty Organization to come back, CETO. All for what? Like we don't have, I think the, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mandrel, you know better than I do as a Navy man, but I don't think we have the logistical capabilities in the South Asian Pacific region that we easily do in Europe thanks to the fact that our Cold War, you know, network is a lot stronger in Eastern Europe than it ever was in, say, Southeast Asia. Mm. Yes and no. Um, I always say that, you know, especially in Japan, the, the logistical uh, infrastructures there uh, comparatively, um, but the, the scheduling is, is terrible, right? Any guy who, who's ever served in 7th Fleet knows that, that that fleet is just constantly on the go, on the move, always doing something. They never have time to train. They never have time to do maintenance. Um, but they they have the infrastructure there um, to get everything done. Uh, whereas We, we in, have in, bases in, coming in in the Philippines as well, again, right? Yeah, we're, re we're rebuilding those bases because we, we lost one of our, our agreements with, I think, Dute under Duterte. And uh, yeah. we re recently got that um, that agreement redone. So, yes, they are doing what they need to do, at least if you think power projection is a necessity, right? But uh, whether that's going to be enough, I have no idea. Uh, I agree with Nullis here. Yeah, mm. a vote from Nullis to assume that... Um, yeah, that there, there's 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 a knife in the pillow. I like Jules Roy's comment. Yeah, I lost that one. Uh, I mean, these people are dangerous. Uh, I'll give them that. I guess we'll you know we'll see what happens with Ukraine. I think the the war in Ukraine will really tell us once and for all whether or not these these people are just stupid uh, or not. And maybe we'll talk about that a bit tomorrow so i guess there's no point in belaboring this further because that was extremely painful um <laughs> but i think it's it's worth looking at uh stuff like this just to see how idiotic some of the thinking is from the people who are uh literally in charge of things uh in a formal sense uh so thanks for coming on guys uh mandrel do you want to show anything 
Uh, yes, I do. Um, of course, I would like to show the Old Glory Club. I had an article that was uh, pretty well received and controversial uh, this last week on their Substack. And uh, I have another article coming out, hopefully on Monday, on my own Substack about uh, how terrible the John Wick uh, number four movie was. So if you, that's stuff, st- kind of stuff that interests you, please go check it out. Mm, that does interest me, actually. I haven't seen the fourth movie, so... Oh, yeah, so yeah. you'll have to you'll have to watch the fourth John Wick instead of coming on uh, D's <laughs> cocktail hour tonight. Oh. <laughs> I don't I don't think I have a means to watch it, but yeah, I guess I'll come on a cocktail hour tonight. I don't have anything planned, and it would be nice to relax after this cringe. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> we're gonna be on a uh, Oliver's channel tomorrow uh, around the same time, right? Uh, for the yeah, yeah same update. time same time tomorrow. Fantastic. Crane update at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and the Prudentialist will be there too. So, all right. Anyway, Ow. thanks for coming on, guys. And what is it you do? We are out. <laughs> <laughs>